this incredibly special Aim High Live, we have the most amazing guest on today for you all. Um, there are already so many people saying hello in the chat. There's people from Maryland, there's people from Bahrain, there's people from Switzerland. Thanks so much all for coming. Um, welcome to Aim High. Aim High is a free online school that's, that's interactive and live, and we're running all kinds of different lessons all across the world in science, geography, English, and so on. And today we have the most amazing guest. Dr. Jane Goodall has led the most remarkable life. The more I learn about her, the more fantastical the story becomes and the more I find myself in awe. She has done more to inspire humans to respect, understand and appreciate nature than almost anyone else in history. And it's not been easy. She's overcome immense challenges along the way and demonstrated time and time again that perseverance, kindness, and belief in what is right prevail. She's written numerous books, articles, featured in numerous documentaries, and even at the age of 86 is still speaking to crowds of thousands all around the world working to make a difference. I was extremely lucky to be introduced to Jane a few years ago by a friend, and it's a real honor to welcome her onto our online school today and to give our students the chance to ask questions and interact with her. Now, to start out, I'm gonna show you guys a quick intro video before I bring Jane in. Ooh. Here we go. It's been an amazing journey, this life of mine. This planet has filled me with the wonder of all living things, great and small. We cannot ignore this earth that surrounds us, that feeds us, shelters us, replenishes our bodies and our souls, and stretches our imaginations, where animals, plants, air, water, all care for us. We're all interconnected people, animals, our environment. When nature suffers, we suffer. And when nature flourishes, we all flourish. I do believe in the possibility of a world where we can live in harmony with nature, but only if every one of us does our part to make that world a reality. So that when you look back over your journey, your life, you can truly say, I did make a difference. Jane, welcome. Thanks so much for coming on. You are now on screen. Um, so to begin with, I thought what would be fun is if, if it's okay with you, um, we could start with, with a game. Um, so, I know that you have obviously learned with incredible accuracy the way that chimpanzees kind of greet and call one another. Um, and I've prepared this game for everyone to start off with. Wait, I'll just go to, go to here. So, Jane, as a greeting, could you give us one of the calls? And I'd like to ask people whether they think this is the distance call or the close call. <laughs> what do people think? Let's see what's coming in. Oh. Okay, m almost everyone is saying the distance call. Jane, which one was that? The distance call means me, Jane, they all have a different uh, sound and we call it the pantoot. Wow. Okay. I'm wondering if, could you, could you give us um, maybe another one of good night, good food or the close call for people's guests as well? Well, here's one. What do people think that one is? Okay, we've got a lot of people saying close call. Um, Spangler is saying good food. Oh, in fact, almost everyone is saying good food. 
the, all, all the answers of good food are rolling in. Jane, which one was that? Good food. Wow, okay, brilliant. Such great work, everyone. Right, we will come back to this screen in a moment. I'm just gonna go back to, to full screen, Jane. Um, okay, so um, I, what I thought would be fantastic is if we could hear a little bit about your story, Jane. And there is a, there's a question that's already come in. Um, this is from Alix, who says, my daughter Charlie would like to know um, which, why chimps out of all the primates why them? Okay, well, um, we have to go back to the beginning when I was a very little girl. And it just so happens that when I was 18 months old, I was given a toy chimpanzee, almost life-size for an infant chimpanzee. And all my parents' friends said, oh, Jane will have nightmares, but it was my favorite toy. However, that is not why I studied chimpanzees. People think it is. I loved all animals. I spent every minute I could out watching spiders and birds and things like that. There was no TV when I was growing up. And so nature and books, it was nature and books. And when I was 10 years old, I found Tarzan of the Apes and fell in love with this glorious Lord of the jungle. And I decided then I will grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. There was no thought of being a scientist because A, there was no study of wild animals at that point and B, I was just a girl. So everybody laughed at me except my mother who said, if you really want to do this, you're going to have to work awfully hard, take advantage of every opportunity, but don't give up and maybe you'll find a way. Well, couldn't go to university, didn't have enough money had to get a job, did a secretarial training, got a boring old job in London. Then came the opportunity, a letter from a school friend inviting me to Kenya for a holiday. Came home where I'm speaking from now. Uh, this is where I grew up in Bournemouth, England, and got a job just over there uh, in a hotel as a waitress to raise the money for my fare. And in those days, there were no planes flying back and forth, so I went by boat. And it was a very meaningful trip, but we don't have time to talk about it now. And stayed with my friend. Then I heard about a very famous paleontologist. That's somebody who studies um, fossils. And Dr. Lewis Leakey. And somebody said, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Lewis. So I went to the Natural History Museum, where he was the curator. <clears throat> I talked with him. I think he was really impressed. I knew so much because I'd read every book I could. And two days before I met him, his secretary had suddenly quit. He needed a secretary. And so that boring old secretary, of course, wow, it gave me a job surrounded by people who could answer all my questions about African animals and plants and so forth. And it was Louis Leakey who'd been looking, he says, for 10 years for just the right person to study chimpanzees. And he asked if I would be prepared to go and learn about them. That's how I came to study chimpanzees. So we have quite a lot of questions coming in on the chat about what um, were some of the hardest moments that you experienced. There's one coming in from Sophie about that, and there are others coming in from Jules and, and Alix. Um, and, and I'd also love to, love to mix that with, um, how long did it take? When you arrived in, in Africa, how long did it, did it take for, for you to um, be able to approach the, the chimpanzees? Well, um, after I'd met Leakey and he'd offered me the job, I had to go back to the UK while he tried to find the money. Not easy and get permission. And finally that was done. And so I went back when I was 26 years old in 1960. And the first setback was that the fishermen along the beaches of Lake Tanganyika, where Gombe National Park is, were fighting over rights to different bits of beach. So I wasn't allowed to go. It was a kind of nightmare. And secondly, the, the situation in the Congo just over the lake erupted. And when I arrived in Kigoma, there were all these refugees fleeing. And so again, I wasn't allowed to go to Gombe, but finally I got there. And then the big problem, the chimpanzees took one look at this peculiar white ape and just vanished. 
And, you know, I knew that if I had time, I could get their trust, as I had with other animals at home. But did I have time? There was only money for six months. And month gave to month, gave to month. And it was incredibly depressing. But actually, I was learning more than I sort of realized because I'd found a peak. And from that peak, I could observe the chimpanzees and I wore the same colored clothes every day and didn't try to get too close too quickly. And eventually one chimpanzee began to lose his fear. And I called him David Greybeard. He was the most special chimp in the whole wide world. And it was he who showed me that chimpanzees can use and make tools. And that brought in funding for me to continue the research. I wonder if we could ask um, how long it took before David Greybeard approached you. Um, how, how long How long do the students think? How long do you think it took before, how, how much patience and perseverance do you think it took? How much time before David finally approached Jane? What does everyone think? Okay, so we've got guesses coming in two years from one million, uh, four weeks from Frostbite, three months as Lily Af Ang, oh, they're sc <laughs> scrolling up so fast. Christy says three months, Sophie thinks two to three months. Um, Jane, how was it? How long was it before David Greybeard finally approached you? Well, um, it was three months. It's about the closest when he began to lose his fear. He didn't approach me, but he let me approach him. And it was about, about three months, but it was almost a year before many of the others would tolerate me. I mean, you know, it was just a question of, of just not trying to push things. But once I had the money, once I knew the research would be funded, actually by National Geographic Society, and they sent a photographer and filmmaker, Hugo van Lauwijk, and it was just then a question of being patient as I had been all my life. And eventually, all of them realized that I wasn't too terrifying. But right at the beginning, when they began to lose their fear, they treated me like a predator. They were very aggressive. And, you know, sometimes, especially in the rain, you know, I don't know if you've watched you guys when it's raining, people take risks when they cross the road. They don't really care. They run across when they shouldn't. And it was when it was raining that sometimes groups of chimps would up in the trees above, they'd start screaming at me like they scream at a predator. I can't make the sound, but it's very frightening and swaying the branches. And once one of them came and hit my head. So I pretended I wasn't interested. I pretended to dig little holes in the ground and eat leaves, hoping that they'd realize I wasn't frightening and eventually they moved away. But that, that happened quite a few times. I'm seeing quite a lot of questions come in from um, about how can we make the biggest difference? So Christy's just said that. I'm gonna answer those kind of questions later. I think we'll, we'll go to that towards the end. Um, uh, so someone called France has asked, uh, how did you pass the time for those months sitting in the in the jungle? Were you alone? I was alone, um, yeah, for most of the time until Hugo joined me, and that was in about the fourth, fourth or fifth, fifth month, I think. Um, what did I do? I climbed every single morning. I was climbing up into the mountains before it was light. Uh, if I knew where the chimps had made, they make nests at night, bending over the branches, then I would climb up uh, to be near them. And sometimes, because it was quite a bit of a climb, I would <clears throat> run down, have supper in my little camp with my old second-hand ex-army tent, and then climb up in the moonlight, it was moonlight, and just sleep upon this peak that I found. I took a tin trunk up there, and I had a kettle so I could make coffee. And... Um, and, and oatmeal, because you just add water and I had sugar up there. And, um, you know, I was always a bit scared of leopards. And if I was up there, I was on my own, I was just me, and I would hear a leopard, they make this coughing sound. So what did I do? I just pulled the blanket over my head. And I had this feeling, which people have said was stupid, that I was meant to be there, and therefore I wouldn't be harmed. Well, Ask, was I stupid or not? There's a question for you all. Wow. Um, I've, I've seen a question just come in from, from Amelia about who inspired you the most. And I kind of want to... Um, but I, I, want to know, I want to know if they think I was stupid to believe that I 
that those, wouldn't be hard. In fact, those comments just coming in, sorry, you're, they, they were just a little bit slayed. Everyone is saying, no, no way, uh, no, you were brave, um, no, never, and it's amazing, um, and clearly not. Yeah, the no's are absolutely Excellent. pouring in hundreds of times. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, so yeah, so um, Amelia has has asked uh, who inspired you the most, and I kind of want to want us to just highlight this um, this this thing that you said that you, you didn't that you didn't have a degree when you started, and 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 do, pe do people need to have confidence to get into this kind of thing? Do you have to be a confident and brash person? So, so someone else is also asking, how do I become an ethologist? Oh, sorry. Well, I was I was inspired obviously by my mother who didn't laugh at me and said I'd have to work hard, take advantage of opportunity and not give up. And that is what I say to all the young people today. And you know, people want to be an ethology, ethologist or whatever they want to be. A, it's important you really truly want to do that because funding is hard to get and there's a lot of competition. But if you really, really want it, then work very hard take advantage of every opportunity and don't give up. So of course, I was also inspired by um, Lewis Leakey when I met him and um, David Graybeard. Um, I am going to quickly now uh, switch across to, so I've got a picture here um, that I'm showing everyone of a chimpanzee uh, smiling like this uh, with its teeth together. And I want to ask all the students, what do you think this chimp is feeling? Um, how do you think this chimp feels? And in a moment, I will ask Jane to explain how this chimp feels. So Posey Joe is saying he looks happy. Um, is that Ilian is saying he looks cheery? A lot of people are saying good food some people are saying angry or threatened or scared um so this is the kind of picture that you see on a lot of cards greetings cards of, of a chimp that appears to be happy um uh jane can you possibly explain what what's going on in the picture yes this um grin is fear and um, the, the, when they're playing a smile with a chimp they have this um long lower lip so when we smile, we show our top teeth. When they smile, their long upper lip covers the top teeth and they show their bottom teeth. So when you see a, a chimpanzee with his teeth covered up here and his teeth showing down here and he's like this, he's playing and he's happy. That's, that's the difference. But the most terrified face I have ever seen on any chimp ever, that was in 1960 when the first chimpanzees were sent into space. And this chimp was called Ham, the first one to go. And his rocket went wrong, his spaceship plunged deep into the ocean. He was rescued. And the pictures that went all around globally the next day in the newspapers uh, and television showed Ham grinning with happiness because he's been up into space. It took four men to get him back into his capsule. He was so utterly terrified. So you can probably look that up. Uh, you guys on your on your laptops later just google uh, ham's grin quotes when he came down i mean it's awful um we've had uh quite a lot of people ask this is this is going slightly off 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 topic and we'll come back to where we, where we were before but there are a large number of people who've asked what was your work with coco the gorilla like i didn't work with coco the gorilla I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> one, isn't it? I didn't work with Coco, the gorilla, with sign language. I didn't work with Washo, the chimp, with sign language, or with Lucy, although I met Lucy, and I met Washo, and I met Coco. I met them all. That's a piece of work, in some ways, having a meeting. Um, so, lots of, so a lot of people have also asked, um, why you didn't quit? What kept you going? Because I'm obstinate. Um, I, I've never quit on anything in my life that was worth doing, I don't think. And um, because all the time I was learning, and if, if it wasn't chimpanzees, I could watch the insects, I could watch the birds. I was learning all sorts of things all the time, like something that's never been described by anybody ever. These, these hunting wasps 
that make a little hole in the ground and then they get some poor creature like a caterpillar and they inject it with something that keeps them alive but paralyzed they push it down in the hole and they scrape the sand over the hole this particular wasp got a stone in his mouth her mouth and banged down the sand on the hole nobody else has ever seen that but i saw it i was fascinated wow so that is the use of a tool um, this brings us really nicely onto the next thing that I was going to show everyone. So I'm just going to show you all the cover of a book. Um, and this is a book by Kenneth Oakley and the book is called Man, the Toolmaker. Um, what do you guys think is wrong about this title? What, what does everyone think is wrong about this title? And we'll give you a few moments to, to say what you think is wrong with it. Um, I will just do a, a very quick uh, welcome to anyone who's come late because I can see that quite a few people joined late. If you are joining late, this is an Aim High Live and so this is the free interactive online school um, and today we have the incredible Dr. Jane Goodall and so you can ask questions whenever you want. We're going to try and um, try and put as many of those questions as possible to Jane, especially towards the end, um, although I'm trying to bring as many of them in as we can. Um, and yeah, on, on Aim High we're, we're doing lessons about science, English, geography and so on. Um, all kinds of things, all, all for free, uh, all, all throughout lockdown and, and beyond. Um, so so do, do check it out afterwards um, and I'll, we'll show you the timetable of what's coming up. Anyway, let's see what people have said. So Natasha is saying it's wrong that only man can make tools. Um, and then someone called Pip has said it wasn't man first um, who made tools. Uh, Kelly saying chimps and ravens and other animals use tools. Um, uh, Chloe's saying it should not be man, it should be chimp, the tool maker, um, because they, they got their first perhaps. Um, anyway, sorry, Jane, if you, I would, I would love to hear the, about the kind of obstacles that you came across when you tried to start, start writing about these things, like what kind of things did, did academics say to you and, and also what's wrong with this title? Well, the first thing that was published, I was still in the field and it was about the chimpanzees, David Greybeard, and then I saw the others using and making tools to fish for termites. And the making part is if you pick a twig with lots of leaves and side branches, you have to remove those before you can use it to push down into a termite burrow. And a lot of people said, oh, she's just a girl, she hasn't got a degree, she hasn't been to college, why should we believe her? Um, eventually, because of Hugo's film, uh, they simply had to believe. But it was at that time said that we were human because man, the toolmaker, we were supposed to be the only creatures that used and made tools. But that was by Western science. If you'd gone into the Congo forest and talked to a pygmy, they could have told you chimpanzees um, used and made tools. They demonstrated for me. And I suspect as Leakey did, that the, the common ancestor, the ape-like, human-like creature that uh, eventually became humans on the one hand and apes on the other. I suspect way, way back then they were using tools and we brought this ability with us in our separate half pathways, the apes and the humans. And by the way, we are the fifth great ape. We literally are the fifth great ape. So what does that and, mean? Yeah. And so um, the other thing that's wrong with the name man, the tool maker, we used to use man instead of human. I mean, man, when I was growing up, meant human beings. And now it's seen as very sexist because it cuts out the women. Um, it didn't bother me and it was normal back then. We didn't even think about it. But now the word man is not so normally used. It's more like uh, humans or humankind or something like that. But yes, many other animals use and make tools. And you know, these guys, you probably know what this is. This is an octopus. Um, I take her around. She's called Octavia. And I use her to, to talk about the fact that octopus can carry empty clamshells or coconut shells, and they walk on their other four tentacles across the ocean floor. And they put down one half of the coconut shell. They ooze their soft bodies into it because they need to be protected and there aren't any rocks and then they reach out and put the other half over the top so they have made a house that's pretty amazing and I already mentioned the wasp that I saw 
um, using a tool, even though maybe it was just one wasp. Nevertheless, one wasp did it. And the first tool was made and used by the one person. Obviously, one person did it. So one of the things that I often talk to my students about is about is that if you look at the genetic difference between a, between a bee and a wasp, then there is more genetic difference between a bee and a wasp than there is between the two most different mammals. So there's more genetic difference between these two things than there is between us and the most different mammal to us. Um, and I, I think this is also a kind of question that's, that's coming on, on the chat. Uh, I wonder if you could um, talk to the students about some of the similarities that we have with, with chimps. That some of the things that, that, that you learned that showed us how close we are to them. And also people are complimenting my drawing skills. Thank you very much. I cannot draw. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Okay. Um, first of all, the way we communicate when we're not using words, we communicate with gestures and postures, and they're almost identical with chimpanzees. So you watch them and you know what they're doing without having, you know, they kiss, they embrace. Um, they shake their fists and they're angry, they stand upright, they swagger, they bristle, they look just like some human male politicians, these male chimpanzees. Um, they beg with hand outstretched, so many postures and gestures the same as ours. And um, also, they have very complex social structure, long term bonds between family members, uh, real friendships. They can show love, compassion, altruism. I was horrified to find that they also have a dark and brutal side, and they can even engage in something like primitive warfare. They're very territorial. They patrol the boundaries of a territory, and they will chase and attack individuals from a neighboring community, except young females. They try to persuade them to come and join them because they want you know, new genes in their community to prevent inbreeding. So they're just so like us. And biologically, genetically, we share 98.6% of the composition of DNA. And we have all these similarities in composition of blood and the immune system. And the anatomy of the brain is almost the same. I, I was wondering if we could lead this in. I thought this was a good place to go um, to uh, a little a game. Um, so what I've, what I've got here is, is a picture of uh, pictures of, of four different uh, chimpanzees, um, and these are all uh, chimpanzees that, that Jane uh, knew, knew well. Um, and I and Jane is now going to give you the name of one of them and describe the chimpanzee, and I want you to try and guess which which one you think it is, just to to give you an idea of how how we can all learn to recognize one another and, you know, chimpanzees are not just an animal that, but a different animal to us that just all look the same. They're all very distinct. Um, anyway, sorry, Jane, take it away. Okay, well, I'm going to choose, actually, uh, Matt, I'm going to choose Figgen. Okay. Figgen was the most intelligent chimpanzee, bar none, that I've ever known at Gombe, and he, taught me so much about what chimpanzees are capable of. And um, he was the second son, unless there were previous offspring that, that I never knew, but the second son of the old female flow. And <clears throat> to give you one example of his intelligence, if a chimpanzee moves off very determinedly, others will probably follow. You don't have to be the dominant male or anything like that. And in the days when we were feeding bananas, um, Figgen was an adolescent and the big males took all the bananas. So what Figgen did one day, he set off with his jaunty walk and the others must have thought, oh, he's seen good food. So they followed him. 10 minutes later, he came very quietly back to get some bananas, but he was so excited. He couldn't help making those noises I made earlier. And so of course, all the big males came running back and Figgen lost his bananas. A few days later, he did the same thing. This time, when he saw the bananas, he had the same excitement, but he went like, oh, 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 and he ate his bananas. So that's an example of real intelligence. I um, almost everyone has gone for. There's been an overwhelming numbers of 
of a number of fours. Um, four is actually Flo, who is Figgin's mother. Um, oh. I wonder if, if you, maybe if Jane describes some of the physical features of Figgin, if we can have another go at guessing which, which one he is. Well, they've all said now. They've, oh. all said, they've all said four, but if you describe some... I said, I said Figgin was the second son of the old female Flo. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a handsome looking male. And uh, what else can I say about him? I think handsome looking male. I have no idea male. which picture you're showing them. You see, I don't know if he's young or old in that picture. Hansy look handsome looking male has actually completely done it. Everyone's now going for two, which is correct. Um, this is this is Figgin. Uh, good work, everyone. I will label him up. Yeah, okay, every, everyone was throwing in the twos after that. Um, okay, so uh, what would be um, great now is, so when I, I'm just gonna switch, switch away from this picture of the chimps, farewell chimps. Um, what, what, what would be wonderful now is, um, when I when I met uh, oh sorry last time I spoke to to Jane um, she told me this amazing story about a taxi driver and I was hoping that you might share it with us today. Okay, well probably some of you know that in 1986 when I realised how chimpanzees were decreasing in numbers across Africa and their forests were being destroyed, I just felt that I had to leave the Gombe that I loved and the forest that I loved and where I learned so much about everything being interconnected and do what I could and that meant traveling around the world and giving talks and trying to raise awareness trying to raise money too by the way because you know it costs money to do all these things anyhow I was uh, very early in the morning going to Heathrow and I was in this taxi and I wanted to snooze but he started off, he knew who I was, and, oh, you're one of those animal lovers. I can't stand you animal lovers. My sister's an animal lover. There's all these people needing help, and you just care about animals. He went, oh, no. So I said, okay. And so I sat forward, and I talked to him all the way. I told him stories. I told him what we were doing to help people to improve their lives, to give scholarships to girls, to find other ways they could live than destroying the environment and so on. And uh, mm, uh, he didn't seem to care. And I thought, oh, well, well, when we got to Heathrow, I didn't have any change. And he owed me 10 pounds. And so I said, oh, well, keep it and make a donation to your sister, because she used to go and um, volunteer in an animal shelter. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think he'd do anything of the sort, grumpy old boy. When I got back two weeks later, there was a letter from the sister saying, First of all, I want to thank you for your donation. Second, what did you do to my brother? She said he's already been twice and helped me with my work in the, in the, in the sanctuary. So the point of this is it's always worth talking because you never know. But the only way that you can make somebody change their mind isn't by arguing with them. It's not by telling them they're bad people. It's, you've got to find a way to reach the heart. And the best way to reach the heart is telling stories. Don't be aggressive. Nobody will change if you're aggressive. They've got to want to change from within. It's following on from <clears throat> from there, I just wanted to show everyone this this picture of of Jane writing up her field notes in her tent at Gombe. Jane, I know that you be never liked being photographed, but this is such a beautiful photograph, and I'm so glad that it exists being able to have this window into you being there. Um, and I, I, there's, a, there's a question that's just come in that caught my eye that I thought I'd just ask before we go into the next section from Freya, um, saying, how, how scared were you when you had the nightmare in the forest? Which is a story I don't know about, but it sounds like someone in the chat knows about a nightmare that you, you had. Um, nope. I don't know about it either. All right. <laughs> <laughs> in which case we'll move on. Okay, so but anyway, great picture. Um, so I was going to ask all the students quickly, um, what do you think chimpanzees do when they are um, when they are scared or nervous, other than the face that we saw before? Um, and for those who are joining late, I'll just quickly show you what that face was. So this is the face that a, a chimp makes when it's feeling nervous, uh, when, it, when it's feeling, feeling scared rather than happy. 
Um, and, and oh, go on. Could you make it? Because so, I don't, I can't see your picture. I, I don't know, know if, it, if it the mouth's open or half open or like this. Oh, this this is the one you described of a, of the scared chimp. So, yeah, I know. It's a different level. Show it. Is it like this or like that? Actually, I'm unable to show it to you because of the way that the way well, this you, you make it. Make oh, it. Oh, me. Uh, yes. Uh, it's kind of like this. Uh, and okay. This. Okay. So what else do they do? Um, they make that face, and if they're not quite so frightened, they sometimes make a pouting face. But what they'll do, they try to reach out to another chimpanzee. If it's a young one, they'll reach their mother. And just touching, that gives reassurance. And sometimes they'll reach out a hand because they're really nervous, and the more dominant one will reach out and gently pat the hand or squeeze the fingers. So this physical contact is very reassuring. We see the same in us. A young child who's frightened will run up and seek to be comforted by an adult. And, you know, again, the mother is the comforting figure or the father with us. Chimps don't know a father, but many adult males will comfort an upset youngster. And of course, also enjoy you know, when you're really excited, you want to hug people, you watch people at a football match, for example, they're all hugging each other and shouting in joy and the chimps behave just the same. So I've, I've shown everyone a picture here of, of, of chimps holding, holding hands with one another, um, this time to, to seek reassurance. I just want to quickly say again, because there, there seems to be a large number of people still joining late. If you are joining late, <coughs> sorry, thanks so much for coming. This is an Aim High Live. And so this is a <clears throat> the live interactive online school and today we have the great honor of having Dr. Jane Goodall join us um, talking talking about her, her story and we've just been talking about chimps seeking physical contact with one another in order to, to alleviate nervousness um, and I thought that would lead into um, ha what, what happened um, when you started to become an activist and you started to try and make make positive difference and there have been so many questions coming in from from all kinds of people I can't even list all of the names about about what they can do to become better activists as well but I, I really want us to to lead into the the story about about medical testing on, on chimps and and how you how you tried to make a change there and, and why well when I um, this this moment when I changed from being at Gombe in the field to traveling around the world was partly because at the same conference where I learned about the extent of deforestation in Africa, uh, I also saw secretly filmed footage of chimpanzees, the cruel training for a circus or entertainment chimp, the, the um, horrible treatment of chimpanzees in medical research laboratories. You know, here they are, closest living relative, intensely social, and there were pictures of chimpanzees in five foot by five foot cages. Some had been there for over 20 years. Imagine it, pace it out afterwards, five foot by five foot and just seven foot high. And there they were by themselves or occasionally if they wanted to breed them, they were in pairs. And they were there because biologically, physiologically, they're so like us. But the scientists wouldn't admit to or didn't want to admit to the fact that psychologically and behaviorally they're so like us so i felt i had to try and do something and that meant i forced myself to go into one of these labs i don't quite know why they let me but they did and i think it was the hardest thing i've ever had to do i ended up going to many of them and once again when i'd actually seen and of course there were tears and everything uh, I, I came out and there were all these men from the National Institutes of Health in America sitting around the table and I sat waiting and I realized they were waiting for me to say something. So instead of shouting at them and saying, how could you do such a thing? Don't you understand? I looked around the table and I said, I imagine that you're all caring and compassionate people like I am and that therefore you believe as I believe. That these conditions are wrong. Well, there was dead silence. They could hardly say they weren't caring, compassionate people. And so that began a dialogue um, when I talked to more and more of them, showed them pictures of what it was like at Gombe. At that point, 
many of my friends who were animal rights people stopped speaking to me. They said, how can you sit down with those evil people and talk to them? I said, if you don't talk to somebody, how can you possibly ever expect that they'll change? Well, it's taken a long time and there have been other groups who've helped. And fortunately now in the United States where most of this research was happening, all those chimpanzees, over 400 of them, are now either in a sanctuary or waiting for the money to finish building a sanctuary. So it's been a long battle, but it's again, you don't give up. You just don't give up. That is one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard. And it also starts to lead into another amazing story, which, uh, which I've heard you tell before about um, why you started oh when when was the first uh extra sanctuary besides gombe opened um i remember it was to do with a with seeing a, a chimp in a, in a market yes well <laughs> i saw little chimpanzees tied up because the mothers are shot often for bush meat or sometimes to steal the baby and sell it for entertainment or a pet and of course those babies can't be put back in the forest the government can confiscate them because it's illegal because they're endangered species and i you know first of all even before what i told you matt i was shown this little chimp in one of the markets in uh, in congo it's now zaire it's now drc it's changed its name three times and this little chimp was about one and a half years old he was lying on top of a very small cage tied to it by a, a rope around his neck. There were people talking and laughing all around him. It was very hot. And he was curled up. And when I moved closer, his eyes were open but glazed. It looked as though he totally lost hope. And I went over to him and I crouched down. I made the soft, close-up chimpanzee greeting. <laughs> and this little thing sat up and reached out to me. And it was just heartbreaking. I couldn't buy him because that perpetrates the trade. But luckily, uh, through the American embassy, we, we went back to the market that night. And he was all alone. I think the owner had fled knowing that, that I was going to do something. And we confiscated him. And that led to the first sanctuary to be established in the DRC. But the story that you were talking about Matt, I think, was the old male Gregoire, and he was in the so-called zoo in Brazzaville, and which is the capital of DRC. And he was so thin, you could see every single bone on his body. And he was toothless. He must have been already about 45 years old. He'd been there for 30 years. And I was with the Minister of Environment, and he was very silent. I took him to show him Gregoire, and he was very silent. And then he looked at me and he said, I think this is our Nelson Mandela. And that was so moving. So he was the one who helped us to change. And finally, we got Gregoire into his own little patio with another old lady chimp. And that, that started the next big sanctuary in the Republic of Congo over the river. I have just one picture from a sanctuary to show to everyone now, which is, um, so this is, well, this, this is a rehabilitation center. It's the, it's the yeah. photograph Chimpunga. that I've sent. Um, That's where Legua ended up in Chimpunga. And this picture of you, you releasing um, Wunda, yeah. uh, the chimpanzee. Um, so, I think what what would be we're, we're, start, we're starting to come towards the end, uh, and I there are some amazing questions coming in um, that we're about to move to. So keep putting your questions in, and we we will get to those in in just a moment. Um, I wanted to ask what one more um, thing before we move to kind of the end bit, uh, which is uh, you flew over Gombe National Park in the nineteen nineties, and something changed, right? Um, and and I, I'd love for you to tell, tell, tell this story um, because I feel like a lot of people uh, here are very worried about the future and, and, I, and I, I know that we can do more about it if, if we work together and I'd, I'd love for you to tell your story about 
about what happened after Flangover Gone Bay. Okay, well, I had already, this was after that same conference that led to changes in medical research. And I got some money and visited various countries in Africa to learn more about the problems faced by the chimps. Why were they disappearing? And I learned a lot, but I also learned a great deal about the plight of so many people living in and around chimp habitat, the crippling poverty, the lack of health and education, the degradation of the land as human populations grew. And it all came to a head when I flew over. Gombe National Park is very tiny. That's the place where I've been now. 60 years next month, 60th anniversary. But this was back in 1990. And in 1960, and actually 72, it was part of a great forest that stretched right across equatorial Africa. And when by 1990, this tiny park was just an island of forest and all around the trees had gone, the hills were bare. And clearly the people living there were struggling to survive more than the land could support too poor to buy food from elsewhere. And that's when it hit me. If we don't help these people to find other ways of living without destroying the environment, we can't even try to save the chimps. And so we began a program called Take Care or Takari, it's known as. And we sent a little group of people, local people, Tanzanians, into the villages around Gombe, 12 of them. And they asked the people what we could do to help them. And we started helping with restoring fertility to the overused farmland with no chemicals, by the way, and working with Tanzanian government officials to improve education and health, then we introduce water management, and then uh, programs where you can borrow a tiny amount, like the Grameen Bank, called microcredit, and start your own little project that's got to be environmentally sustainable. And that program has been so successful that it's now throughout the whole chimp range in Tanzania, 104 villages, and it's in six other African countries. And into that, we have, we have also introduced education of young people that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I think I, I have the, just this one picture here, which I'm wondering if this is this is part of the schemes that you set up. So this is a picture of Anna, who's an expert builder in um, fuel efficient rocket stoves. Is this part of one of the programs that you that you were uh, involved with to try and help local people to um, to to live to live uh, sustainably in near chimpanzee environments? Well, the ones that I know of best are ones like you know starting up a small. Um, sustainable project like having a tree nursery and then you sell the saplings very cheaply and this has been used to reforest the um, slopes and to put them in the schoolyards so that the children have shade and you stop the erosion or they'll just have a few chickens to sell the eggs um, coffee farms shade grown coffee where the in natural environment can come back and in all these ways, particularly if they borrow this money, when they pay back, and almost every single one does pay back, they're proud, it's theirs. It's not like handing out a, a, a grant. They pay back, so now they take ownership. And it's been so successful. So it really is making me feel a lot of hope for the future, that along with the youth programs. There are a lot of people saying wow to what you just said on the on the on the chat. I am um, okay. I think since we're getting towards the end now, um, what I'd love to do is talk about um, talk about roots and shoots. So um, something that uh, I don't know if this is one of those quotes that goes around the internet as something that you haven't said, but I think it's something you've said. Um, what you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make, um, and. I know that I know that this was uh, well. I think this was part of the philosophy of setting up roots and shoots. And I'd really love to encourage a lot of the people watching to join this as well because it's an incredible community organisation with local bases everywhere. Um, Jane, could you tell us a little about that, and then we will go into everyone's questions. Okay. Well, um, to tell it briefly, it was 1991, and 12 high school students in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania came to see me and they were worried about all kinds of things and that were happening in their community 
And so I suggested they got others who believed like they did. They came from eight different high schools and we had a meeting. And from that meeting, Roots and Shoots was born with, as you say, the main thing, every individual makes a difference. But every day we live, we make a difference. You can't live through a day without making some impact. And we're lucky enough, we can choose. Everybody listening today can choose. If you're in abject poverty, you probably can't choose because you're going to have to buy the cheapest food to stay alive, buy it whether it's harmed the environment or hurt animals or, or anything. And um, so because everything's interconnected, which I learned in the rainforest, and every little species matters, we decided every group would choose three projects to make the world better, to help people, to help animals, to help the environment. And what began with those 12 high school students is now in 86 countries and growing. And it's got members from kindergarten, members very strong in university and everything in between. And there's all the people who've been through it and they've now got important jobs out in the big wide world and they hang on to the values they acquired in Roots and Shoots. Uh, respect, respect for the natural world, respect for animals, respect for each other and learning that you may have a different religion, a different culture, your skin may be a different color, you may wear different clothes, but underneath the main thing is we're all human beings. And you don't have to totally agree with somebody who grew up in a different faith or culture, but you can respect their right to be who they are. There are a lot of uh, questions coming in from people saying, how can we uh, find our local Roots and Shoots? The best thing to do, because there are lots of different organizations, is search Roots and Shoots on a search engine and, and say where you are. Um, and someone was also asking, can adults join? And I don't know the answer to that. James. Yes, yes, yes. Great. We've got groups starting it. We've got in some prisons, and we've also got um, staff in big corporations forming a group. So adults can. So do and join. Look up roots and shoots dot org, and that will direct people to the different countries. And we will also put the link in as well. Um, if people are from the AIM High School could put that, the rootsandshoots.org link in. That would be great, please. Um, OK, right, we will go to questions. Uh, just before we do, um, I am just going to show everyone, well, say thank you all, all for coming. Um, and also say, um, here's what's coming up uh, over the next few days. So we have uh, lessons coming up tomorrow are Will Brexit end the EU? Is my green your green? And we have inspiring guest Cal Major, who um, has paddleboarded the entire length of the UK um, from Land's End to John O'Groats, campaigning for uh, campaigning for the ocean. She's going to be joining us tomorrow, so do do come for that because she is amazing. Um, and then this is what's coming up next week. What's the most futuristic farm? What can we learn from plagues of locusts? How can bubbles treat cancer? Um, how can you trust your moral beliefs? And from sonnets to, to battle rap, a short history of violent verse. These are some of the things that are coming up. Do join us. Um, if you haven't already, then please join up to our mailing list, which you can reach via the link just below. Um, and also please do follow our socials if you wanna keep up with the other lessons that are gonna come from other, um, other teachers, cause not just me, I'm just doing science and having the great privilege of talking to Jane, which is amazing. Um, and uh, yes, do do share, Aim High with, do share Aim High with your friends and do write to us and suggest topics that you'd like to see um, and ask your school if they'd like for us to come in because we are starting to work with a lot of schools to try and bring these kind of experiences to people and help to connect um, people like Jane to, to yourself so that you have the opportunity to, to meet and interact with her. Um, right, okay, so I will leave those things up, um, but let's go to questions. So uh, there are so many questions. Um, let's see how many we can get through. Um, first one, so there have been a lot of people. Um, so Liv and Newman are just a few of the names that I wrote down as the chat scroll past who've asked, what are your views on zoos? Well, it depends on the zoo, but in my life, um, you know, I've been on the planet 86 years. Zoos have changed hugely. There's still some, still some terrible zoos that shouldn't be, and they need closing. But we've had an amazing program. One of the big, awful things is boredom. 
just imagine if you're an intelligent creature, and we know now so much about animal intelligence, and you're stuck in a small cage with nothing to do. First thing I did in the labs was find somebody who went and introduced t tasks for them, fun problem solving. How do you get your food? You don't just get it handed in a dish. You have to poke, poke for it, work for it, you know, solve problems. That's made a very big difference. But the really good zoos now, they have terrific enclosures, people who care for the animals. Uh, they're raising money to help conservation of the species in the wild. They're doing a great job in education. And so the really good zoos I thoroughly approve of and work with and the others, first we try to help them, and eventually some we try to get closed down. I've had the, so there have been a lot of questions coming in, um, which is, and this is this is one of the main topics I was hoping that the questions would circulate around that we could use the last few minutes on. Um, so Sophie has asked, can we redeem ourselves when we're looking at the future of the planet? Um, Madison has asked, uh, how do you feel about Greta Thunberg and the campaigning that, that she's doing, which you don't have to answer, but you can if you like. And, uh, and also there have been a lot of questions asking about what can we learn from COVID-19, from, from coronavirus, about, about our ability to, to continue our civilization and what we need to do to, to make the world a better place. Okay, well, let me start with that one because I think it's very topical and very important. And the thing about the COVID-19 pandemic is that we've done it to ourselves. It's been predicted for years and years and years by people studying what, what we call zoonotic diseases, diseases that start in animals and jump the species barrier and spill over into humans. And it's because of our disrespect of the natural world and our disrespect of animals that this virus was able to do the jumping. We cut down the forests. Animals are then forced to spend more time with each other who normally wouldn't have. And a virus or bacteria can jump from one animal to another. That makes a new disease. And then animals are pushed into closer contact with people or people move deeper into the forest. And this again, gives an opportunity for a virus or bacteria to hop over, especially with the, uh, the bushmeat markets in Africa. That's where HIV AIDS began, because of butchering chimpanzees and selling them for food. And then today, animals are captured and they're trafficked. They're sent off to, for example, the wildlife markets in Asia. And there, different species, sometimes from different countries, are put close together in terribly cruel conditions, unhygienic, blood and, and urine and so on can contaminate the seller and the buyer. And this is how COVID-19 is thought to have begun in the Wuhan um, wildlife market in China. And also SARS was another one that began in one of these markets. But, you know, these markets are all over Asia. The good news China has banned and is thinking of permanently banning trafficking, selling and eating uh, wild animals. And there's a little animal called a pangolin. If you don't know him, look him up. He was used in Chinese medicine. And just today came the news that the pangolins are now not any longer uh, to be used in Chinese medicine. So that's another fight that we're, we won't give up on that until the moon bears are rescued and you can Google them as well. And so the point is that hopefully after this pandemic um, that we'll start respecting animals more. Think of the factory farms. Think of if you're a meat eater, think where your meat probably comes from. A place where billions of animals are now crowded in these terrible conditions. And, you know, cows and, and well, cows, I've only got cow here. They have personalities, they have feelings. The pigs, they can have feelings of fear and pain. And do, by the way, please, there's something I would like all of you to do because it will give you a laugh, but you'll love it. And that is a pig. She's called Pig Casso. Can you see? Oh, if you lift like, it up a bit. It's up there. Further, keep going. There we go. There we go. Okay, that's Pig Pig Casso, not Picasso, the artist. And if you Google her, um, three videos will come up. Choose the one with the 
yellow borders, the geographic one. You will love to look at that. So do Google pink Casso. And so, you know, we need to respect the animals. But if we go back to business as usual, I mean, we've seen during this pandemic, skies become clear. Some people have never seen clear skies before. Some people have never breathed clean air before in the big cities. They won't want to go back to the old polluted days. Unfortunately, some of our leaders are dying to get back to business as usual, to jumpstart the economy. But if we want to continue with our existence on this planet and life as we know it, we have to think of a different way of interacting with the environment. We mustn't always choose short-term material success at the expense of protecting the natural world for the future. And we've got to get a new green economy, a new way of thinking. And it's you young people that I'm relying on because unfortunately we've left you a horrible world. But certainly there's many people like me wanting to help you that together we find ways to do things differently. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, just very briefly to add to that, pigs can even play video games, joystick controlled video games. Um, anyway, do please join uh, Roots and Shoots, look up your local organization. It's an amazing community organization uh, and I really encourage people to join it. Um, thank you so if much. There isn't a, a Roots and Shoots in your school or your area, you can start it. Just find a parent or a teacher, get your friends together, sit around and you choose between you three projects, animals, people, environment, start your own group, be in touch with us so we can share what you do. Please do. And also I will be um, back in about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes to, to talk more about uh, climate and ecology. If you want to learn some more of the follow on things from this um, and do do head to the school if you want to sign up and, uh, and follow us on our, on our socials as well. Um, and uh, to finish off, I thought we could perhaps say goodbye in the way that chimps say goodbye. They don't say goodbye, they just get up and walk away. You see, there's a difference. <laughs> exactly. But I, maybe we should say one thing, you know, encouraging. We'll get through this pandemic. We always do. But then we're then faced with the climate crisis. And that's not going to go away. It's going to get worse if we go back to business as usual. So I hope everybody listening is going to help to push for this greener world tomorrow. Thank you so much, Jane. And uh, for those of you with extra questions, you can do ask me the questions afterwards. I'll try to try to answer them for you. And uh, we shall now say goodbye because Jane has got so many important things she needs to do. Um, by the way, Matt, I could say good night. I mean, it's not good night for most people, but um, it I is actually say, for many people I, watching. I, I, is do it's like you know i gave the greeting call at the beginning so i'll do that first and then you'll hear the difference and you hear this sound not not that often but if there are chimps nesting on one side of the valley and the other these calls go back and forth and it reminds me of the old town crier saying all's well with the world and so listen to the two and you'll see the difference here's the greeting <laughs> And here's the good night, all's well with the world. <laughs> Different, right? That was amazing. Thank you so much, Jane. We shall say to say goodbye to everyone there. All right, farewell, everyone. We'll see you all soon. Farewell, goodbye.